apologize, Council, for deciding to focus on Venezuela. It's not a topic that tends to cheer a lot of people up. But it is the most important issue in our hemisphere by far, and perhaps um, in the world, one of the most tragic situations. So I'll let the mayor talk about the situation on the ground and the dimensions and scope and scale of all of these crises, which are very, very profound. What I'm going to look at is US policy responses to, uh, to the Chavez and then the Maduro regime over time to give some background and, and perspective. Um, and then talk about some options. Where are we today? Right? And, uh, um, and what is going to resolve this crisis and when? Which is the question all of us who have been following Venezuela very closely have been asking for a long time. Uh, I want to leave a lot of comments for uh, questions and a lot, a lot of time for questions and comments. Um, we talked about a soliloquy. Hugo Chavez once called my organization, which is the Inter-American Dog, the Inter-American Monologue. So um, I want to disprove that and I want to give a lot of time to get your questions and have a good uh, exchange. How did we get to this awful place that Mayor Smolansky will describe when he arrives? Um, one point is that Venezuela was not in great shape before Hugo Chavez was elected in 1998 and took office in early 1999, exactly 21 years ago. Um, it's a country that, uh, for those of you who follow Latin America, know that, that the 1980s was so-called lost decade. Uh, Venezuela had two lost decades, it had the 1980s and the 1990s, um, and uh, lost 40% of its national income over those two decades. So Chavez emerged for a reason, and he won the election in 1998 for a reason. He got 56% of the vote, which what everybody concedes was a free and fair election. And he was railing against judicial order, indicting the elites, a uh, populist, and, but he put his finger, I think, on the legitimate grievance that Venezuelans had. Venezuelans were uh, very poor. Um, they were victims of mismanagement and corruption. This is before Chavez. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to compare today to, to then, but I think the context is important because he, did, he emerged for a reason. And Venezuela is where it is for a reason. So I think he put his finger on the limited grievances that people had. It was a very exclusionary uh, system, high levels of inequality, political parties were corrupt, discredited. Um, all the things that one hears about today, about many places in the world, that's what Venezuela was like in 1998. And Chavez was, was no alternative. And the problem fundamentally is that Chavez came in and he made all decisions. We kind of went about systematically dismantling every democratic institution and concentrating power in his own hands. So, and what resulted were extraordinarily high levels of incompetence, corruption, mismanagement um, that we see today at a totally uh, different level of magnitude. But that's what happened. Um, and he was very antagonistic towards the private sector, many of whom worked in the oil industry. And Venezuela is totally dependent on oil, 95% of its exports of oil. Has been this way. Chavez promised to change it, he didn't change it. It's still this way today. That was one of his promises he didn't, he, he didn't fulfill. Um, so a lot of people were very, very frustrated and angry, and he came as kind of the, the savior. Um, huge, very charismatic uh, person, I met him you know, a couple of times, and um, he had, when he came in, to understand where we are today, oil was $10 a barrel when he came in in 1990. In 2006 or seven, they went up to $140 a barrel. This is the country with the largest proven oil reserves in the world. When Hugo Chavez would attack the United States, they would, they would come back at him, tit for tat, go back and forth. And 
God has always won that battle. Was, I think my view, I said it back then, it was a mistake to do that. And of course, Chavez led the coalition of Latin American governments against the United States during the Iraq War, which was very unpopular in Latin America and other parts of the world. And Chavez was very good at taking advantage of that for his own political purposes. President Obama comes in, um, things continue to get worse. There is just a gradual deterioration. Um, he is extremely concerned about Venezuela. It's a high priority for the administration. He raises it with other heads of state. Um, but he has a different style than President Bush and President Trump. Um, there was support for efforts to, for negotiations between the government and uh, the opposition uh, to try to encourage a diplomatic solution to the crisis that did work out very well, very well. And um, the Obama administration also started what today is the key policy to Venezuela, which is sanctions. But they only did targeted individual sanctions for those accused of corruption and rights violations who would freeze your assets, particularly your visa or whatever it is, individually for those who were found responsible, and Obama began that. Um, Trump has, comes in and takes a much harder line against Maduro, and I think more aggressive, certainly rhetorically, and also in policy. Um, he expanded and strengthened the sanctions regime, increased the targeted, targeted individual sanctions, then imposed financial sanctions, and then a year ago, just a year ago, he did something that we always call, back in the old days when Chavez was around, the nuclear option, which is sectoral sanctions on the oil sector. And today, that is the principal instrument that's being used by the administration against Maduro, together with diplomatic isolation of the Maduro regime. And the United States, to its credit, has been working with other Latin American countries, especially Colombia, um, which is the most affected by the crisis, as Mayor Spolansky will tell you shortly, and uh, Brazil. So there has been a multilateral effort. The politics have changed over time. The recent elections in Mexico and Argentina, which are two very important Latin American countries, have not been helpful. There is a much softer, neutral, Approach and unwillingness to really be very, uh, to be very harsh against Maduro. So the politics has changed a little bit, but the United States is talking to uh, to other governments and the Europeans to try to work together. There is a key debate going on. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Mines will talk about this. Uh, you may have different views about it, but uh, whether these sanctions are having the effect of making an already terrible situation for which Nicolas Maduro is responsible, even worse, and therefore fueling the refugee crisis, or whether really these sanctions are designed in a way that really just hurt the regime and don't hit, hurt ordinary Israelis. Um, I'm of the view, and I've seen in a lot of studies, that they are hurting uh, ordinary Venezuelans. It's hard to have sanctions against your own, the only source of income of your economy uh, and not have it affect ordinary uh, people. So, again, the regime is responsible, not, and, it, and it may be justified, maybe you have to do that, because you have to put the pressure that's on, and maybe it forces Maduro to, to, you know, to go to the table and to, to negotiate in good faith, and it has been able to do it, you can make that argument. But I think that it, it is aggravating and already a very serious situation that the mayor will talk about uh, in a second. Trump comes in and comes up with a, with a formulation that still is around called All Options Are On The Table. He said that in August of 2017. Um, of course, we all know that all options are always on the table for any foreign policy challenge that the United States confronts. Um, I question whether saying that, which was interpreted as a sort of signal that
that there was at least consideration of a military intervention or military operation was not very helpful. And of course, threats to the Venezuelan military uh, also coming from Washington, saying that you really have to, you really have to, we're going to, we're going to go after you, we're going to be very aggressive, which in my view has the opposite effect of what it's intended to have. Makes them dig you even further, they're not going to listen to a foreign power, especially the United States. A year ago, or a little over a year ago, Juan Guaido emerges as an interim president by virtue of the Constitution, he's the president of the National Assembly, which is the only democratic legitimate institution in Venezuela. Uh, was first voted in the opposition in December of 2015. And there was a view uh, in Washington, I think, that this was the end. Uh, finally, you had a leader, a young leader, a popular leader, Mr. Smolansky's generation, which is the hope for Venezuela, that generation, his generation. And he was able to unite the opposition, and he had a theory. The theory was, we're going to get everybody out on the street, we're going to get millions of people out on the street. And the armed forces, which is the main underpinning and pillar of the Maduro regime, is going to flip. They're not going to go after, they're, they're, they're not going to go after people on the streets. They're going to see that, that, they're going to see that the people are with the opposition, and therefore they will, they will shift, abandon them. Uh, it didn't happen, and I think uh, there was a lot of overconfidence that it would happen, and it didn't happen, and I think it was a little bit unrealistic in retrospect that that would happen. So that produced a lot of disappointment and frustration because there were promises, and, and, and I've been in Washington and saw it in Washington, and a lot of senior officials said, this, you know, this is over, we're going to do it and, and President Trump himself was told that this was going to for the solve the problem. There was also an effort last year by the Norwegians to try to pursue a negotiation to create conditions for free and fair elections. There were meetings in Oslo and Barbados with representatives from the Guaido and Maduro. Talks broke down for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of skepticism about negotiations are really uh, viable because they have been tried and they have because the government was not acting in good faith and was playing games. Today we have a very difficult moment. President Guaido, by all accounts, has less support than he had a year ago because the change that was promised wasn't delivered. Maduro is still, still in office as a de facto president of Venezuela. And there's no sign that the armed forces are about to abandon. abandon. But he is the most popular politician in Venezuela. He has about 45% of it, according to a poll I saw today. Maduro may have 12%, 14%. And over 80% of Venezuelans, according to all the polls, want to change the government. This is not a question of a divided country. This is a country desperately wants change, but you have a repressive regime that uses the armed forces, that uses the police, that uses vigilante groups, um, and carries out repressive measures as they have done with Mayor Smolansky and other, and other figures of the opposition. So they need to have to leave the country. Um, just to talk about breaking news, and maybe you'll have some information on this, uh, President Guaido left the country uh, some days ago. He was met with uh, Secretary of State Pompeo in Bogota, and then with Boris Johnson, he met with Macron, uh, various other meetings, the head of the European Union in Europe, and, uh, and met with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, we're still waiting to hear whether uh, there's going to be a meeting with President Trump, and maybe David could give us the news. But let me just say for the record, uh, from my perspective, I think uh, it was sent a very, very bad signal that President Trump does not do uh, After investing so much in this cause, um, it could be interpreted that there's not the unflagging and unwavering support uh, that the U.S. has talked about. And a meeting with him, I think, would be essential. I'm sure the mayor agrees with me. I don't know if it's going to happen. He's going to speak in Miami on Saturday. 
but um, there's still a chance something happens tomorrow or maybe after Saturday. I don't know. But I just want to sort of mention that as something that's kind of kind of uh, in the air. This is the most, by far, the most important issue on the American policy. If you talk to members of Congress and if you talk to members of the U.S. administration, it's striking what percentage of their time is devoted to Venezuela. People work on South America. South America is a lot of countries. There are big countries, Argentina, there's Brazil, there's Colombia. There's, they work 90% on Venezuela. That's what they focused on because of the gravity of the situation in that, in that country. Now, what's the plan today? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, but those message has been to get more people to join the sanctions regime, to increase sanctions, to increase the pressure, uh, to get the Europeans to do a lot more than they've done because they haven't done very much, by and large. Um, but will they work? If they haven't worked over the last year, the oil sanctions went into effect a year ago, <coughs> we're here a year later, and uh, they haven't worked. So uh, it's hard to make the case that, that they will, I think, or at least there are some doubts or questions whether they will. And the Maduro regime has been more resilient than many people expect. As I said, over 80% of the people want change, but the economic, but the armed forces remain with him because they have economic interests because of corruption and they're very involved in the Venezuelan economy. Because of fear of the regime, many military officials are in jail because they were suspected of, of, of challenging the government. So there's a tremendous amount of fear. And for some Venezuelans, there's still the revolution of Hugo Chavez uh, 21 years ago. There's a Bolivarian revolution it's not a big percentage, but uh, while Maduro has 12, 15%, Hugo Chavez has 56% support for Venezuela. He has a favorable image uh, by the people of the country. So Maduro has adapted to the, these uh, tough sanctions. Um, Russia is playing an increasingly important role. Maduro has China on his side, has Cuba on his side, has Turkey on his side. There has also been an expansion of proliferation of illicit economies, drug trafficking, illegal gold mining, uh, armed groups. Many of the armed groups are engaged in these activities, those activities, armed groups in Venezuela, armed groups in Colombia, where there are guerrilla groups that have come over and are based in Venezuela. And recently, uh, an effort to dollarize the economy, which has um, enabled the country to a bit more, uh, at least in certain areas of Caracas, the capital, not the rest of the country, but Caracas. So there's more access to products. They don't have the severe shortages, at least in certain places that there was before. Now, this may be a bubble, and I think it's a bubble, uh, but it, it's there. It's there. And the fact that you see more things on the shelves in, in markets than you did before. So what do we do? Um, I think military action will not happen and should not happen. Um, and again, I don't think there's any appetite for it. The other idea is that there's a popular uprising. I see that as highly improbable. I don't see any sign of that. So I think that despite the disappointing record on negotiations, uh, it's an option that could build on the mistakes of previous negotiations. Um, and even Secretary of State Pompeo said in recent weeks, that this is something that the United States uh, could support. We also need to get more actors involved. This is a global issue. Venezuela is on the global chessboard. So it's not just uh, this region, this hemisphere. It's Russia, it's China, it's Turkey, it's India, and others. And the armed forces have to be involved too. That's where the power is. And they have to be up to them. So I think there are ideas on how to make it uh, more effective. Uh, the political solution may take time, it's more complicated than we believed a year ago. Um, we have to create the conditions for it. It's going to be pretty messy. Um, and there has to be a lot of humility about this. I don't think anybody can be very confident in what's going to work these days because things have been tried and they haven't worked. But I think that the right mix of carrots and, and, and sticks, uh, pressure, uh, plus guarantees
gives him some incentives for the regime uh, may help lead towards um, democratic uh, elections and, uh, and, a, and a transition in the country. Um, let me just say two final points and then I'll turn it over to the real expert. Um, one is there is, I hope, that in 2020 that decisions by the United States regarding Venezuela um, are taken in terms of uh, policies that could help lead to a democratic transition in Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is also a domestic political issue, especially in the state of Florida. We have an election this year. Florida is a battleground state. And uh, I'm hoping that electoral <laughs> politics, politics doesn't shape what kind of decisions are made by the administration. Um, because the diaspora community, Venezuelans and the Cubans, Nicaraguans, others are all are concentrated in South Florida. South Florida is a very is a swing state. So I'm just hoping, I just want to point that out, and hoping that doesn't happen. There's just too much stake to let domestic politics really shape decisions. Today, Venezuelans are desperate to be saved from Hugo Chavez's ruinous legacy. Thank you very much.
migration and refugee crisis in the history of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are the largest displaced population in the world with no natural catastrophe and no conventional war. And if we include those countries that have suffered from natural catastrophe and uh, conventional war, only Syria is above Venezuela. But if, it's no, or if, if there is no solution during this year in my homeland, probably by the end of 2020, the world would see more Venezuelan refugees than Syrian refugees. And that will happen again with no earthquake, with no tsunami, with no hurricane, and with no conventional war. So one of the lessons is that when you don't have democracy, when you don't have freedom, also you can have millions of people fleeing, trying to find opportunities in other parts of the world. So last year I visited the region 16 times. I went to Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, eh, Curaçao, Aruba, Mexico, Costa Rica. Also I had different eh, meetings with the Venezuelan community here in, in the US and also in Canada. And I had ever, ever seen in my life, not even when I was mayor, I had to deal with so many difficult challenges like for example, trying to decrease kidnapping. I've never seen uh, so much suffering of what I have seen uh, on those visits. I visited a refugee camp of an indigenous community in Brazil, where a man told me that his eight children died because of lack of medicine. I saw a teenager telling me in tears that her mom was lying to her for weeks, that she was having lunch and breakfast, but she was not, because the only food that she had, it was for her, until she found that her mom was lying, and, he, and she told her, you will not die because of me, because of, of guaranteeing me to have the food and you not. So we have to flee uh, Venezuela. I've seen so many students that have been brutally repressed by the regime with tanks, with rubber bullets, with bullets, that have been in jail, um, like the one that is called the Tom, which is in Caracas. Uh, uh, it is in Caracas underground, where you don't have uh, you don't have visits, you cannot see your lawyers, you have extreme temperatures to get tortured, and, and if you don't talk, you could get killed. Like Fernando Alban was killed at Caracas Council, one that was thrown from a, uh, from a seventh floor uh, in a jail in, in Venezuela. So basically what I want to say here is that we're having a country in this hemisphere that is having the same consequences on migration, on the economy, on socially and politically, the same as countries that have been through war. If you see any indicators of Venezuela, it is only compared with countries that have passed, that have war or have uh, any other uh, collapse. Um, Five million Venezuelan migrants and refugees is more than the whole population of countries like Croatia in Europe, in Europe Ireland, Costa Rica, Panama, Kuwait, or New Zealand. That's uh, the whole population of those countries is fewer than the Venezuelans that are now uh, displaced. And actually, the people that are fleeing Venezuela is not middle class, it's not people that are in a good position. I mean, the vast majority of people that are fleeing Venezuela come from very poor areas, rural areas. So they don't have even the money to buy a bus ticket and don't think about any uh, air flight ticket. So you have started to see what it is <laughs> known in Spanish as los caminantes, in English, the walkers. So they just flee Venezuela, literally walking from Cúcuta in Colombia, which is the border to Venezuela, to Lima, the capital of Peru, or to 
Santiago, the capital of Chile. So that is about at least 4,000 kilometers. 4,000 kilometers is pretty much the same to give you a perspective. If we start walking right now from here, Richmond, to Salt Lake City, Utah, how desperate, may I ask, may I ask this, how desperate has to be someone to walk from Richmond to Salt Lake City to find a place to sleep, to find a place to eat, to find a hospital to cure his diseases, or just literally find a place to be safe. How desperate someone has to be to walk again from Richmond to Salt Lake City. How desperate has to be a woman to walk that distance to give birth. 70% of the women that are giving birth in the border in Colombia are Venezuelans. And 70% of the women that are giving birth in Brazil are also Venezuelans. At least 1.5 million of the Venezuelans that have fled are suffering or are in risk to suffer from malnutrition. How desperate has to be a young student to take a boat like the Cubans used to do decades ago to get to Aruba or Curaçao. Those islands used to live from the tourism that came from Venezuela. Now they are receiving people in a very vulnerable situation where they get through boats or they get or they get to their uh, swim. So in my opinion, it's no better evidence of the horror that the poor Venezuelans uh, uh, have been living when you visit any country in the region that has received hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans. Colombia, 1.6 million Venezuelans. Peru, 900,000 Venezuelans. Chile, 400,000 Venezuelans. Ecuador, 400,000 Venezuelans. Brazil, 230,000 Venezuelans. Argentina, 150,000 Venezuelans. Panama, 100 Venezuelans. United States of America, 450,000 Venezuelans. Spain, 330,000 Venezuelans. So this is not only in Colombia. This is not only in Brazil, which are the world's So this is a regional or a global uh, 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 problem that is, of course, impacting on the infrastructure, the service, and the budget of, of those countries. And I have to say, any time that Venezuelans have had the opportunity to work, the ones of ones of them have been successful and impacting positively on those economies. Because every Venezuelan that is fleeing the country is leaving a son, a daughter, a mom, a sister, a brother in Venezuela. The most shattering story that I've heard, especially from young uh, people, is that they have said goodbye to their parents or to their grandparents because they don't know if they will see it again. Especially if they have grandparents of 70 or 70 or 80 years old, and for them it's very difficult to leave Venezuela. They just say goodbye because they don't know when they go back. That's the story that I worry about. So how we get here? Um, and I said Professor Schiffer was doing a very good lesson on, on, on Venezuela. Well, how did we get here? Venezuela used to be one of the most stable countries in the region. It used to be a reference on democracy in the region. It used to have a booming uh, economy. Uh, it used to have a solid democracy when you saw on the 1960s, on the 1970s, so many countries in the region in war on, with hyperinflation, with dictatorships. Venezuela had uh, a free media, had an had a alternative in, in, in power, had a pre, free and fair elections, had a legal political parties, uh, and people were doing good. But the economy was not diversified. It depend only in oil, which was, a, in my opinion, a mistake, especially when you have a country that you can diversify its economy. I'm going to talk about it later if we have the time. And also, the political parties did not uh, renew the leadership. So we saw presidents that were present in the 1970s be president again on 1990s. So then this came this guy, Hugo Chavez. And I, one of the memories that I had when I was 
a, a boy, and it was with my father watching TV. It was at midnight of February 4th, 1992. And I see a tank, military tank, trying to get to the palace. I think that's my first political memory that I have. And I asked my father, what's that? And, and my father told me, this is a coup d'etat. It's a coup d'etat against uh, the president of Venezuela. Then this guy became a savior, uh, Hugo Chavez. And I didn't like him because he used weapons and he killed a lot of innocent people to try to get to power in 1992. He failed twice, but he tried. And in that moment, so many innocent people were killed and were wounded. But a lot of Venezuelans saw him like a, like a hero that was something. And he was elected in 1998. How was he elected president in 1998? We have free and fair elections. Anyone who wanted to run as a president was allowed to. We have political parties. We have free media. We had an alternative in power. So one of the lessons that I wanted to share with you today in Venezuela is that we are probably one of the best examples in the world right now that how democracy is used to destroy democracy. That was happening in Venezuela. In Venezuela, democracy was used. The tools that democracy gives to the leaders and societies were used to destroy democracy. And now here we are in a dictatorship, which in my opinion is not even a conventional dictatorship. This is not another Caudillo in Latin America. We are facing, this is a very personal opinion, a criminal regime, a criminal state that goes beyond a dictatorship. But it started 21 years old, when it was 13, that's, that's why I wanted to start with that. Using democracy, and they destroyed democracy. So yes, they had elections, and they, and they changed the constitution. So suddenly, people elected a president to be for five years with no re-elections, and then he changed the constitution uh, less than a year after he was elected. And suddenly we have a president that, uh, from being elected for five years and not having re-elections, now six years with indefinite re-election. And then everything became centralized. And, and then, then uh, our generation, that Shifter uh, said, said uh, very kind words and I appreciate it. started in 2007 when the oldest TV station in Venezuela was shut down, Radio Caracas Televisión, and the student movement started. 2007, but that was already 12 years ago. Because that's how the generation of President Guaido and I, that were studying together, decided, oh, we have to go to the streets, lead non-violent protests to defend freedom, to defend democracy, to defend the freedom, to defend freedom of expression. Um, and here we are. So, uh, when I, when, I, when I say this, um, is that all the lesson is when, when you see any leader that has a, a authoritarian characteristic and is trying to uh, control the best uh, defense that any country has is in civil society. And what I learned from Chavez is that he made the most radical change one of the most important changes at the beginning of his uh, first term, specifically when he changed the constitution. And after that, everything was uh, more difficult. So what we're having now, we're having an unprecedented situation in Venezuela. We're having a regime that is usurping power, uh, that is still in the palace, as uh, Mr. Schifter said. Well, we have an interim government that is started a year ago. And you see how, how that happened. Well, in 2018, Maduro was elected uh, or re-elected uh, president of Venezuela. Even the Electoral Council that he controls said that almost 70% of Venezuelans didn't go to vote, which was, in my opinion, very important. The Electoral Council that he, he controls said that almost 7 out of 10 Venezuelans didn't vote. More than 50 countries 
didn't recognize that election, called call it a fraud. A organization such as the Organization of American States called that illegitimate. And in January of 2019, <clears throat> taking the Constitution, which has, has, has a very important article to explain what's going on in Venezuela, Article 2.3.3, uh, uh, says that when there is a maximum of power, the Speaker of the House becomes the interim president. So, uh, President Guaidó was sworn as the president of National Assembly, and after January 10th, which is the day that the president should start with, the term in Venezuela, uh, the maximum power was declared and President Guaidó was sworn uh, as interim president of Venezuela, which a, which a huge support of the people. Still, the main leader of Venezuela has become a leader of the region and worldwide. <coughs> he has just, uh, as, as, as Mr. Schiffer said, has just, he's just in an international agenda. We had a very important meeting with Prime Minister Trudeau, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, um, Angela Merkel, Macron. Probably the next phase we'll have that meeting with President Trump, we'll see. Um, and he has, had the, he has been recognized by almost 60 countries. So why is not the, the why, why have we not been able to get rid of the regime, which would be the, a lot of questions. Again, because we're facing a criminal regime. A criminal regime that is running drug trafficking, Illegal mining, smuggling, those are the many illicit activities that they are running. With the regular groups that were created in Venezuela, what we call the Spanish Colectivos Armados, which are basically uh, civil guerrillas, that are in a lot of the urban places, ELM from Colombia, and the support, the support in the very important international actors such as Cubans, which at least 23,000 agents are there, Russians, China and Turkey. Those, in my opinion, are the four main international actors that were based. So, it would be great if in Venezuela we have a solution through negotiation, through election. It would be great. And, and President Guaidó has promoted that. But at the same time, and this is a personal opinion, I'm going to end with this. Um, this is a very personal opinion, and I know this is sensitive. Um, when you have millions of people, when you have the life of millions of people in risk, such as Venezuela, that every day people die because of hunger, <coughs> because of diseases, because of violence, because of human rights violation, and that country is in risk to be empty because everyone will flee or will die because in my opinion, in Venezuela, we're having a slow motion genocide because things have changed. Now you cannot kill some maybe 300,000 people like in other parts of the world decades ago. But we're having a slow motion genocide. The international legal framework has some mechanism that will be implemented to protect those people, like the real treaty or the responsibility to protect, among others. And it's legitimate. That's that is one of the because millions of people, millions of Venezuelans, are in risk. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there saying that uh, I shouldn't be here. I should be in my country. I believe in exile. I if I had been asked years ago, even when I was mayor, I would be speaking in a such a beautiful place and with so many people to reach on about Venezuela, probably would have laughed, but here I am because I am convinced that we have to keep the fight. We have to persevere. And I am inspired of my family. My grandparents left the Soviet Union. They were persecuted in Ukraine. And they landed to Cuba. And my grandparents with my father that was born in Cuba were also persecuted and they had to flee Cuba and arrived to Venezuela. And then it was my turn. I will leave Richmond today. <laughs> and then it was my turn, the third generation that have been persecuted by this type of regime. So um, that has been my inspiration not to, uh, not to stop uh, uh, working and, and, 
and has stopped being involved in, in, in the servant as a public servant. I don't have children, but my, my biggest dream is to have my children in Venezuela, to see them study in my country, to see them working in my country, uh, to see them enjoying a country with freedom and democracy. And I'm sure that we're going to achieve that. And when adults, um, if they got all the opportunities in Venezuela and they don't have to flee like I had to do with my father or my grandparents, I'll say mission accomplished no matter where I'll be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Mayor, I have a question for you. Well, a statement and a question. I lived in Caracas, Venezuela back in 88 and 89 and worked for the Department of State at the embassy. My children went to school with Venezuelan children and children from all over the world. So you have part of my heart. My question to you, oh, also that was during the time of the economic riots. They were starting back then. Um, what do you suggest that we do as regular American citizens not working for the government? I would love to hear that. Hello. Thank you for your, your kind work. Um, that's, that's a question. That we always uh, have. You know, I, I see uh, the disaster that we have today. Uh, the, it's a future that I, you know, don't, don't see at all. Uh, Venezuela is going to be even a poorer country than it was when Chavez took over. Chavez took over because the poor were with him. So now we have less money and more poor, and we're going to bring back a democracy with the same people who were in power, you know, when Chavez took over. So the, it, it, this futuristic uh, blindness that I would like to somebody, you know, answer if how are we going to change difference, not only in Venezuela, but in the whole of uh, Latin America. I mean, you know, we can talk about Argentina. We can even talk now about Spain. You know, where Sanchez wouldn't meet with uh, Guido when he was there. Where he's empowered now with, by two votes 
and they, you know, the right and left are beginning to, uh, you know, argue with each other like they haven't in 80 years. So this is a chronic problem that we have all over Latin America. It, it's maybe it's not as bad as it is in Venezuela right now, but for the future, can many of you give us a more happy ending? Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that uh, as soon as we restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela, the ones who are going to run the country are the ones who were before Chavez. And President Guaido is is the main example of it. When Hugo Chavez uh, came to power, was Juan Guaido was like me, 14, 15 years old. Uh, so I truly believe, not only my generation, but the people that are even coming after our generation. Because we have grown up or we have been born in a dictatorship. Um, uh, we, I don't know what is that country that I described to you that was a stable, that had a solid democracy, that had a booming economy. I just know it because my parents told me, because of what I saw in school, in university, what I have read in books, but I did not uh, have that uh, Venezuela. My generation and the generation after that have, didn't enjoy that Venezuela. So when you when you are born or when you grow up in a place where you don't have freedom and you don't have uh, democracy, you don't have rule of law, and you don't even have food and medicine, um, you you learn a lot. And, and 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 I think on the future. And I was saying Venezuela could not depend only on oil. Venezuela could diversify its economy through the minery, through through the gas fields, through the agriculture. We have a, such a fertile soil through tourism. So that's the Venezuela that I see. And it will be hard, yes. Venezuela will not become a, 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 a safe from one day to another. You will not see food from one day to another. You will not see medicine from one week to another. But if we're able to start building institutions, uh, give uh, the opportunity to civil society, and also uh, try to, uh, try to uh, get involved the people who have fled, and especially the ones who have been successful and, and have had a very nice experience in countries such as the US or countries in Europe, I think Venezuela could recover faster than what many people think. Thank you for your remarks, both of you. Two questions. What role did Russia have in the collapse of Guaido's attempted revolution? And secondly, what should the US government be doing? Russia has been involved in Venezuela um, since Chavez came in. They, they, send, they provide a lot of military equipment um, to, uh, to, to the government. Um, a lot of the interpretation, unlike China, which lent Venezuela $65 billion and has an economic interest, and, the Venezuelans owe uh, the Chinese $20 billion at this point, so there's, there's, a, there's a real interest there. The, the Russians tended to be more of a geopolitical kind of, you know, you're close to us in Ukraine, we're going to be in your backyard here. And so it was a positioning, it was a geopolitical positioning. That has changed a lot in the last year, uh, when Russia is... Um, is involved in uh, very much uh, helping uh, Maduro with the oil <coughs> oil economy, and is involved more in the economic sector. Their you know their state-owned enterprise is very is playing a very important role in sustaining Maduro. So Russia is a key player, and uh, this is not something I would have said two years ago, uh, but it's something in 2020 that I think is a real reality, and I don't see any signs that they're going to that they're going to uh, pull back. There have been attempts by the U.S. officials to try to talk to the Russians, to engage with the Russians, um, and they haven't been very successful so far. But uh, that is definitely a, a major concern. Uh, Mayor, this is probably a question uh, maybe you can answer more, or uh, maybe both of you can answer. I'm not really sure. Um, but when the Ch uh, Chavez regime banned private gun ownership in 2012, uh, do you think 
when the Chavez government banned private gun ownership in 2012? Do you think it made it easier for the government, the police, uh, the military to oppress the population? And do you think that we would be in a different position now had that um, not been implemented and taken effect? Uh, 
Uh, and second of all, he's, he's the only leader who's been able to A, unify the opposition, and B, mobilize people on the streets. And of course, people get tired, they're disappointed, they're frustrated, they thought the end was near a year ago. Um, but you know, we just have to keep fighting and going back. So yeah, I think it's very, very important. Uh, thank you both for being here again. Um, so the mayor, you said that uh, you believe like uh, international institutional intervention is the best path forward uh, for Venezuela. What policies or organizations can we advocate for here on the ground in America um, to help support that and help bring that closer to being something that's brought to the global ethic? Yes, I think I, I, I could. Maybe I didn't explain myself well. I didn't say it was the best option. I said it's a legitimate option. Uh, and it has to be considered when the life of millions are in risk, like what is going on with Venezuela right now, because every day we're having people fleeing or dying because of hunger, diseases, human rights violations, and, and violence. So there are ways to do that uh, uh, on a consensus on international community. One of them is the, what, what I call the TR, the Rio Treaty, which has been uh, uh, reactivated at the Organization of American States. Uh, every country but one uh, voted in favor, and there is one article that allows uh, to use a, 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 a military coalition to protect the people that are in risk. As Mr. Schifter said, of course, not every, not every Latin American country is on that page, but at the same time, I don't think they have to say that publicly. Those things have to be discussed privately because you are facing a very dangerous uh, regime that you cannot reveal your strategy. Uh, then you have the responsibility to protect. They have to be implemented through the United Nations. Of course, we have there the problem with China and Russia and the Security Council. But I think, I think it, even we have those countries there that they veto, they veto in, the, in, the National, in the Security Council a resolution for free and fair elections a year ago, by the way. So that's how involved are Russia in, 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 in Venezuela. They veto a resolution of free and fair elections. So could you imagine if they discuss r to But I think even though you have to start discussing that, you have to put that on the agenda. But you have to discuss that on a very serious way, in a very responsible way. Uh, this not, that's not a thing that you have to be on Twitter or on Instagram, like doing a campaign. Um, and there are, uh, there are other uh, uh, mechanisms that the international legal framework allowed to, 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 if we have a, a different solution, welcome, welcome to that solution. But we, if we don't, I think it's, it's, it, is, it is irresponsible to not discuss it that when you, walk, when you are discussing it to protect the life of millions of people. Because the worst thing that could happen to Venezuela is that nothing happens. That's the worst thing that happens. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I guess this is more of a historical question, why Chavez was unable to diversify the economy and move it away from oil, as, like, especially like in 2002 and stuff? Why he was unable to and why he didn't, yeah. Well, that goes from $10, 12 to $140. Uh, that's, you know, that's the goose that can lay the golden egg. You're not going to focus on, on diversifying. What I do think is true is that um, that I think there is a consensus, and, and the mayor will correct me, but I think there's a consensus and a recognition, even by those who preceded Chavez, that um, if they had to do it over again, uh, they would have diversified the economy a lot more, because precisely because of these wild fluctuations in prices, it's sort of a boom and bust, and the economy and the Venezuela has to become more diversified. And I think the people who are thinking about the so-called day after, uh, whenever that day after is, uh, when we have a new government, um, and, you know, I think clearly the oil sector is going to be important because that's you know that's what the, what the country has. But I think over time, uh, eventually, you want to have a much more diversified economy. It's just you know you may say you want to, but if you, if you, if, you, if you have those kind of oil prices, you just rely on that. It's easy. And just something that I always share as a, 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 a foreigner visiting my country is to take them to a gas station. 
So we, we, we went to the gas station and we put uh, gasoline in the car and at the same time I invited, him, I invited them a coffee in the convenience store or a water. The coffee and the water was way more expensive <laughs> than the gasoline in the car. And that was years ago when I was a student and then I was a mayor. But now, and this is literally now, if free gasoline. I mean, gasoline in Venezuela is free. It's free. Imagine if you take car. You might even take it today. Start driving from Sorry. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if you take your car now and you start driving, I don't know, from here to Miami to go to the Super Bowl on Sunday or to see President Biden on Saturday. And you don't pay anything on gasoline. It's free all the time. Actually, sometimes we, we still have some people that put the gasoline. It's not like that you put it. And, th and, and, and those workers, sometimes they use the gasoline to clean the, 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 the street. So it's insane. It's insane, that thing in Venezuela. And then that needs to change with the diversifying the economy. I just wanted to give that anecdote. <laughs>